thanks to everyone for, for coming. Um, we will be talking today about the humanitarian development nexus. And as I just mentioned, we have people in the auditorium, but we have at least 50 people um, online from around the world uh, hearing this particular, um, s this particular seminar. It's a seminar, um, it's a new seminar series uh, with our new name. This, the center's name is, will be officially changed on November um, to the Johns Hopkins Center for Humanitarian Health. And this is the second official seminar, uh, the first one being uh, on Syria. And these are monthly seminars that uh, we will be having. And specifically, they are meant to bring in on new topics to, to the humanitarian field, topics that won't be actually covered generally in detail in lectures um, because of how relatively new they are. So with pleasure, we have two speakers who are really leading in this area on humanitarian development. Um, and I will introduce them one, I will, I will introduce Xavier first, and then after he's done, I'll introduce uh, Teresa, who's calling in, kindly calling in from, uh, from Geneva, Switzerland, on Skype. So Xavier, uh, Xavier de Victor is the, his official title is the, uh, ma he's managing the global program on forced displacement at the World Bank. I've had the, the pleasure to be working with Xavier for the last uh, couple years in my previous position at UNHCR, and he really has spearheaded um, the move from within the bank to actually try to address the humanitarian development nexus, and he will go into details about that. Uh, Xavier is one of the few that I know of, actually, that has come from the bank, uh, start, sorry, he was working with the bank, but previously was working with United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, and he was, many of the students here, I think, always ask, how do you get into this sort of, uh, sort of field? And often it really is by chance. And so Xavier uh, was just talking about how he was doing this, and um, maybe actually he can briefly tell you, because I think it's better to come from his mouth, but it's, uh, it is interesting, because it's just often by chance that these things, how these things occur. Um, but I'll just read briefly, the Xavier is a French national who joined the bank in, uh, in 1996. Prior to joining the bank, he's held various positions working in fragile situations, mostly in Africa, but also Europe and Central Asia, and most recently in the Middle East and North Africa. His last position was a country manager for Poland and the Baltic countries. Um, Xavier also, and I believe I shared a link with you, but Xavier was responsible, and uh, I'll hold one up uh, uh, for the books, but Xavier was responsible for leading the recent um, report that I mentioned to you on uh, fragile, uh, sorry, on displaced populations um, and how to link development and humanitarian. So we'll start with Xavier, and then we'll move to Teresa, and then after we will have questions. So Xavier, it's a pleasure, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul, for your very, very kind introduction. I'm not sure I deserve uh, each and every word of it. Um, I will just need a little bit of technological yes, support. Yes, so will I, actually. OK. I got it. You got it? Good. This, okay. in theory, once it's up, up, can okay. we do the... Um, can you make full... Uh, yeah, exactly. There yeah. it is. OK. And, and so then you're just using this to okay, go to good. the next slide. And there's so a pointer at the top. So thank you so very much for the opportunity to be here. I mean, it's really uh, uh, a pleasure. I was asked to talk a little bit about the, the nexus, but my, my sense is that uh, the nexus comes to life only when it is applied to actual situations, to actual issues. And one of the issues that always comes when we talk about these linkages between humanitarian and development is the issue of forced displacement. And so what I would like to do today is briefly to take you through some of our thinking on uh, forced displacement as development actors complementing uh, humanitarian uh, interventions. And just before we start, you know, I just would like to emphasize that this is about people. It's about people in distress, and it's about how to best support them. And there's a consensus that it's not only a humanitarian issue, but that a development response is needed. Now, until then, you get everybody to agree. Then comes the question, what does it actually mean? What can actually development actors do is it just that we do income generation support instead of livelihood projects, which is essentially the same thing with a different jargon? Or is there something different uh, that we could do that we could contribute? And so what we tried to do with this report was to try to 
articulate a little bit what such a development response could um, entail, keeping in mind that obviously it depends on the country, on the circumstances, and it's very country specific. And since we are fairly new to this area, we relied a lot on UNHCR uh, for their experience and expertise. We initially thought about doing it as a joint report, but then we looked at our bureaucracy, at, with all due respect, their bureaucracy, and uh, the prospect of multiplying one by the other seemed to be formidable, so we decided to do it as a bank report prepared with support of uh, UNHCR, which simplified considerably the process. So let me talk uh, briefly about different points, uh, a bit of background on the nexus, on the crisis, a few words on the approach that we're taking as development actors, and then some of the findings, recommendations, uh, issues of financing, and uh, next steps. And the first thing is, this is not new. Back in 1950, the then uh, UN Secretary General was already talking about the need to link humanitarian aid and, and development. And the uh, UN High Commissioner for Refugees um, uh, was making a similar statement in the year that I was born. Um, so there have been a long series of uh, initiatives, uh, 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 but you know, ICAR 1 and 2 in the 80s, uh, CRFK in Central America, the bookings process launched by Sadako Gata and our then president uh, Jim Wolfenson, the 4Rs, GSI, Solution Alliance, uh, 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 and so on. But you know, we're still talking about it 50 years later, which suggests that it hasn't gelled uh, uh, very, uh, very effectively. And so what's new? I think what's new is different things. First is the Syrian crisis, as Paul was alluding to, which creates a different political environment for institutions like ours. Uh, our shareholders, the large OECD countries, um, now find it uh, of interest to them, and that changes the, the environment in which, we are, uh, in which we are working. I think the second thing, and I'm still speaking from, a, from the perspective of a development uh, institution, is that um, there's been a lot of progress in the fight against extreme poverty. And so extreme poverty is now increasingly concentrated in selected groups of highly vulnerable people. And therefore, we naturally are moving towards trying to support these selected groups of highly vulnerable people who happen to be also the, the, the beneficiaries uh, or the, or the uh, 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 targets of humanitarian actors. So, so our agenda are converging because of, because of the way the world is, is evolving. I think we've also made progress in our discussions with um, uh, UNHCR and others on what I call the money issue. I mean, I think we've, we've, we've <coughs> come to this realization that it's not about trying to find a new source of funding for humanitarian work. This is about trying to do things differently. And this is also, not about trying to pretend that we have joint goals and identical objectives. We don't. We have very, very consistent objectives. Uh, but an institution like UNHCR, which has a mandate of essentially protection for refugees, an institution like the World Bank, which has a mandate of poverty reduction, have different objectives. It just happened that on this crisis, they largely coincide. And then finally, I think one of the progress we're making is that we're trying to avoid words that we don't really understand. Um, and there are many in this area. You have entire conferences about uh, the nexus, uh, which at the end of the day boils down to how do we get our bureaucracies to work together and how do we get to play on each other's uh, um, uh, competitive advantages. So you won't hear me talk about transcending the nexus because I actually don't understand what it actually means. Um, a few words on uh, the crisis, because as, you know, uh, an institution like ours is based on numbers. So we, we started to look at the numbers, and obviously all this is based on uh, UNHCR figures. So there are about 65 million people who have been uh, displaced, but this is really the additional juxtaposition of two crises. One which is a refugee crisis, people who fled uh, conflict and violence and have crossed an international border. And the other one being internal displacement, people who fled conflict and violence but are still in their own country. Uh, and you, you, see, you see the numbers. But I think what's also interesting is to put this in perspective. So you have about 16 million refugees under UNHCR mandate and an additional 5 million Palestinian refugees. So that's a total of 21. If you add asylum seekers, you're about 24 million uh, refugees uh, and 
and, and re people in refugee-like situations. That compares to about 250 million econo uh, economic migrants, right? And similarly, there are about 41 million uh, IDPs, internally displaced persons, that compares to about 720 million internal economic migrants. So um, this forced displacement is only a small part of a much broader phenomenon of human mobility, but yet it's a very distinct part of this phenomenon, as we will discuss uh, later. I think the other point uh, uh, to make and in, a, in, a, in an academic institution like, uh, like here, the other point to make is that you know, such nice graphs sometimes give the, the misleading impression that we have good numbers, and actually we don't. Um, uh, just to take one example, uh, UNHCR in Norway produced this, this short report that observes that at the end of 2013, the number of refugees in Norway was estimated at 18,000 by Eurostat, 46,000 by UNHCR, 132,000 by Norwegian Statistics Local Office. Right? And you're talking about Norway. So, you know, when you start thinking about how to count IDPs in the midst of Somalia, obviously uh, the challenges are even more formidable. And let me, let me emphasize this, because when we mention 65 million people, it creates a lot of perceptions, which creates political discourses, which tr then translate into specific policies, right? And I'm not only talking about this country, I'm also talking about uh, the, the European co continent. And yet we're not sure that these numbers are correct. Right? And I think there is, there is a, a, a huge agenda in trying to figure out you know, what's behind these numbers, how are they constructed, especially on the IDP side, and, and what, it, what does it mean for policymakers in the various uh, uh, set of countries that are being affected. Now what's clear is that this is not a country for Europe. This is not a crisis for Europe. This is not a crisis for the US. Over 90% of the refugees live in developing countries, and the quasi-totality of IDPs live in developing countries. And actually, if you look at it, it's mainly in uh, middle-income uh, countries. It plays out very differently across regions. So I just took the two regions that together account for two-thirds of the, of the displaced. And you see that in sub-Saharan Africa, it's mainly an IDP crisis with ups and downs. In the Middle East and North Africa, you obviously see the impact of the Syrian crisis, but also the, the, the impact of the wars and the conflict in Iraq, in Libya, in Yemen, and, and um, essentially there. The only thing that was interesting to us is that there is sometimes a perception that the crisis is spinning out of control, that we're getting into a world where this problem is, becoming, uh, is taking a new dimension. And actually, if you look at the numbers, it's the same 10 conflicts that have caused the majority of forced displacement every year since the end of the Cold War. Uh, so what you have is rather a number of conflicts that have not been resolved, that have not been addressed, that cons continue uh, to, to, um, you know, to, to, to produce uh, a negative uh, consequences, negative impacts uh, on, on their own people and on their neighbors. And similarly, because there is a degree of stability in terms of the crisis of origin, there's also a degree of stability in terms of the host countries. Because the host countries are essentially neighboring countries. 92% of refugees live in countries that are just one border away, right? Uh, so it's Iran and Pakistan for Afghanistan, it's Ethiopia and Kenya for, Ethiopia, for Somalia, it's Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey for Syria, and the like. And about 12 countries have been hosting over 50% of uh, refugees every year, the same 12 countries, every year since uh, the end of the Cold War, since 1991. Maybe a few more points. 94% uh, of forcibly displaced live outside of camps. And actually, forced displacement has a very, very significant urbanization component. People tend to move to cities, um, which also has implication when we think in terms of the sort of support that we can provide, but also sort of solutions that we can contemplate. And about half of today's refugees have been in exile for less than four years. So the median is at four years, basically, right? And, and half for more than four years. And actually, if you look at the numbers of refugees per year, you see that there is a big bump at the beginning, which is Syria. Uh, then it goes down. There's a bump around 20, 25 years, which is Somalia. And then another bump around 35 years, which is uh, Afghanistan, right? Now, if you take out uh, Syria, and Afghanistan, the two outliers, you end up with the same sort of uh, median and mean uh, duration of, of exile. 
few words on IDPs. Um, first, uh, from our perspective, I think we need to deconstruct a little bit the concept. Because actually, it includes people who live in very, very different situations, from the people who live today in Aleppo or in Mosul under the bombs, uh, to the people who live in Colombia and have been displaced in the suburbs of Bogota for over 30 years, almost a generation. Right? And so, <clears throat> from our perspective, I mean, if you look at the numbers, you have about one third of IDPs that live in war torn countries, another third that live in what I would call unstable regions of relatively stable countries, say northern Nigeria. And then another third that live in fairly stable environment, uh, uh, Colombia. And, and I think it's important for us to make this distinction because obviously when you think in terms of the needs of support, the needs are very, very uh, different. There's also sometimes this perception that today's IDPs will be tomorrow's refugees. Now obviously it's very difficult to predict the future, uh, but if we look at the past, uh, there is no evidence that people who have been IDPs for a long time become refugees when the crisis becomes protracted in a significant uh, in a significant manner. So let me say a few words about the the, the, the lens we're taking as a development institutions to uh, uh, to look into this problem. We see our interventions as part of a broader effort that also includes security and political components, and of course also humanitarian components, right? We see this agenda for us as being complementary to humanitarian intervention, but distinct from, uh, uh, from the humanitarian agenda. And we see it as part of our own mandate, which is about reducing poverty. So it's part of a broader effort, from our perspective, to focus on a group of people uh, who are particularly at risk of poverty. And therefore, our focus is on the medium-term socioeconomic dimension of the crisis. Now, this is a positive way to put it. Let me put it a bit maybe controversially in a more negative uh, or, or look at the flip side of the coin. It's not about emergency response. We're not really equipped for that. It's not about a rights-based agenda per se. We're not, we don't, we don't, you know, this is not our comparative advantage. But it's about complementing what's done in terms of emergency response rights-based agenda by focusing on the socioeconomic medium-term dimension of the crisis. And we have two groups of focus. Uh, they displace themselves and their hosts. And obviously, I think there is uh, a consensus on that. We need to work hand in hand with humanitarians uh, throughout the crisis, uh, from the onset, you know, through, to, to, to the time of the crisis, and as we work towards solution, with roles that can change as things evolve, uh, uh, but, but that, that really call for a synergy that's not sequential, but that's really uh, continued throughout the uh, uh, throughout the events. Now, I mentioned two groups of focus. Let me just say a few words on them. Um, the question we ask ourselves is, why should, we, why should we need a different program, a distinct program for displaced people? Why can't they just take advantage of the normal poverty reduction programs? Why do we need to have a displacement project in addition to a normal development project? And the answer we have to that is that when you look at these people, they've lost everything, they've gone through trauma, uh, they, they often don't have rights, et cetera, et cetera. And that gives them a number of vulnerabilities that makes it very difficult, almost impossible for them to take advantage of the opportunities that are available where they live. Uh, and so we see our role as really trying to help them offset these vulnerabilities uh, so that they can once again you know, take advantage of, of the opportunities that are available, and not only as a distant dream within the context of a durable solution, but also uh, during the, the time of exile. And similarly, when we look at the host, you know, we, we talk about host communities, and we often focus on hosts. So let's, let's also focus on communities. These are communities who live in the developing world, who are facing their own development problems, their own poverty problems, who are trying to make progress towards poverty reduction, and then suddenly face a transformed environment because of the inflow of people. And so the question is, how can we help them continue to make progress towards their own development agenda in this transformed environment? And what, if, what, if, what they've experienced is really a shock. It's a large, it's a demographic shock that unsettles a number of equilibriums that existed before, um, uh, and, and the eventual outcome will, will depend on uh, uh, a number of, of different factors. So let me say a few things on findings and, and recommendations. Um, we first try to look at this agenda of prevention. And when we think about prevention, we sometimes think in the following terms. Conflict causes displacement. If you want to prevent displacement, prevent conflict. Now, this is 
very, very important. Uh, this is an agenda that I think we all uh, feel very strongly about and are all probably very committed to. But the reality is that in our lifetime, there will unfortunately still be conflict. And so the question we ask ourselves is a little bit different. Assuming that there's a conflict, is there something that we can do to minimize its development impact, its negative development impact? And so we try to look a little bit at uh, 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 some of the data and the evidence that's available. We, felt, we saw first that, you know, contrary to some perception, security risks are the main driver of displacement. Obviously, the people who can afford to flee are going to be more likely to flee than the people who cannot afford to flee. But what really drives them is not economic uh, destitution. Uh, it's, really, it's really security fears and security risks. I think another point which is important is that the crisis takes some time to build. So it typically takes, on average, it takes 4.1 years between the first time you have 25,000 people living in a country and the peak of the crisis. Right? And so these are crises that, to some extent, can be forecasted. Not always. We all remember Kosovo. We all remember Rwanda. But in many cases, this can be forecasted. And that means that there is time to prepare. There is time for the host countries to prepare so that the, the phenomenon can be managed in a more effective manner, a little bit like we do with natural disasters, where we shifted the agenda from an agenda of response to an agenda of preparedness and, and response. And then finally, the last point, which is in, in any situation, most people stay behind, typically above 90%, in half of cases over 99%. Uh, and while we focus very much on the people who are displaced, let's not forget that the people who stay behind also live in utter destitution, to the point that minor shocks may then push them uh, uh, into exile. We looked, we tried to look at this question of what's the impact on host countries, because you often hear that host countries are negatively affected, that they, they, they carry a burden, uh, uh, that uh, uh, you know, the presence of refugees causes lots of problems, and so on. So I mean, we, we try to look at the evidence. And the first point is, in most host countries, Jordan, Lebanon being the exception, in most host countries, the share of refugees to general population is around or less than 1%. Right? And as such, the impact are mainly local, right? You're talking about countries that are growing at 2 to 3% a year, 2% a year, just because of demographic growth. You add 1% of refugees, it has an impact, but the impact tends to be in those areas where refugees are concentrated, much more than national impacts. And as you may remember, I mentioned that there's a shock. In economic theory, we say that the outcome depends on initial conditions, on the nature of the shock, and on the response. What we see that in terms of national security and economic growth, the impact really is largely driven by these initial conditions, which means that the presence of refugees can exacerbate pre-existing challenges. It rarely you know, creates new challenges. So just a, a piece of statistics, out of 991 um, uh, country uh, situations of country ac accepting refugees, in only eight cases did this have possibly an impact on national security. In only eight cases do we see a conflict concomitant. I'm not even talking about causality, I'm just talking about concomitants out of 991. Uh, when we talk about jobs, so once again, you know, from a purely economic perspective, we have more people, so more demand, more demand, more jobs, if, they can be, uh, if the private sector can provide a response. Uh, but the point there is that the jobs are not evenly distributed. So if your skills are complementary to those of the displaced, you gain. More people want to buy your products. If your skills are the same as the displaced, you face more competition. So it's not so much an issue of refugees stealing jobs. It's much more an issue of how is wealth distributed uh, uh, within the community and how are the, the roles uh, being distributed. Services, obviously, more people, more demand. More demand needs more supply. Uh, uh, and so we all see a huge strains on, on delivery capacity. This is why humanitarian actors try to provide uh, health services, education services. I think the question there is that we all agree this is indispensable. We also all agree this is unsustainable. And so the question is, how do you do the transition from externally provided services to country systems? And, and, and how do you manage that? And then finally, you know, you often hear that uh, uh, countries say that we should restrict the rights of the displaced to protect the natives, especially in terms of jobs. Well, what we find is that whether people have the right to work or not, they actually work. 
uh, it's just that in one case, they work in the formal sector, they're taxed, they contribute to the level of their skills, while in the other case, they work in the informal sector, they are not taxed, they contribute at a lower level to, of their skills, and they tend to be you know, working more uh, or more exposed to uh, abusive uh, situations. So from our perspective, and obviously it all depends on the country, and, and one has to be very sensitive to the political economy of, of each situation. But restricting the rights of the displaced does not often clearly help the hosts. A few words on the displaced themselves. So they suffer an initial shock. They lose a lot, not only assets, but also social networks, uh, um, human capital. They, they undergo very, very traumatic experience. And, and this is something that for us is very difficult to deal with, because as a development agency trauma is typically not uh, uh, something that we deal with. Uh, it's seen much more as an individual issue. But when you look at these groups, you're talking about 30%, 50%, 60%, 70% of prevalence of, of, uh, uh, of traumatic experiences. And it's very difficult to discount it as just uh, an, an, individual, an individual issue. Now, obviously, uh, uh, women and girls face particular challenges. Uh, I think what's very... What's very uh, sad in a way is that there's fairly little quantified evidence on, on you know, how this plays out and, and how this works. From an economist's perspective, if you want to re remedy this, you need a job. It's not sufficient, but it's necessary. Or it may not be sufficient, but it's necessary. And not only, once again, as a dream for, for the future, but now. Um, and that's where we find that the environment for recovery can be very challenging. People may not have rights. People also may not live in places where there are jobs. So 80% of the displaced live in economies that have fared less well than the global average. And within these economies, 72% live in regions that are faring less well than the country. So you have people who are living in lagging regions of poorly performing economies. Even if they have the right to work, there may just be no job. And then finally, there's a notion of planning horizon. And the fact that people, because they have they are in, in you know, legal limbos, uh, tend to have difficulties to plan for their future. And, and if we look at our own lives, it does take planning. It does take investment. Uh, uh, this is something that's very, very difficult for lots of these people. Now, when we talk about long-term solutions, uh, obviously, the framework is a framework of durable solution of UNHCR, or, or also promoted by, by UNHCR, which is essentially about trying to regain the protection of a state, either by returning to your own country, uh, integrating slash naturalizing in your country, in your host country, or being resettled in a third country. Now, uh, this is all very important, but our take is slightly different, complementary, right? Not, not uh, opposed to it, but complementary. For us, it's, it's not so much about where people live, but it's about whether they still have these vulnerabilities. Now, think about the people who've undergone very, very traumatic experiences. Uh, just getting a new passport is great, but it's not going to be the end of it, right? Think about the Burundian uh, refugees who've been naturalized Tanzanians. They found a durable solution, but they may still face a number of socioeconomic issues that derive from their experience. So, so it's a little bit of a, different, uh, of a different focus. And when you look at numbers, you know, it's very clear that some people return, some people don't. The proportions vary across circumstances. Actually, quite a number don't. Uh, return is a very difficult process because it's not about going back home. It's about rebuilding your life in, a, in an environment that has been transformed. And, and in many cases, it's not successful. In many cases, you see returning refugees become IDPs, uh, uh, sometimes becoming refugees again. And so for us, the focus is not really on return, but it's on trying to help make it successful. Similarly, we see integration. We see a lot of de facto integration. It may be a good coping strategy for the short term. It's obviously not a sustainable strategy for the medium term. But I'd like to, find, to, to end with a piece of very sobering statistics. Um, um, in the EU, it takes about 15 years for refugees to reach the level of employment of economic migrants. And I think it's important for, for two reasons. I mean, I think the statistics is important for two reasons. First, uh, because it really shows that there's a need for long-term support, and unfortunately not only in the EU, but, but in many of, of, of the other situations. Uh, but also because when you have all this talk about refugees are the same as economic migrants, well, sorry, but no. It takes them 15 years to reach the same level of employment, so there must, there must be something different, right? Put in the same place, the same environment, you don't have the same outcomes. So statistics for the US are, are not strictly comparable. It's a little bit less. Um, it's uh, eight to 10 years. Um, 
it's not clear where the difference is coming from, whether it's because of a different social model or whether it's because most of the refugees in the US are resettled, while most of the refugees in Europe are basically you know, people coming on, uh, uh, on their own. Um, so basically, you know, from this comes uh, a brief agenda for us. We need better data, better evidence. You know, I mean, the sort of work that uh, uh, is done in, in institutions like, y uh, like yours is absolutely crucial. We don't really know what works, what doesn't work at this stage. Uh, we, we may try to advance this agenda of preparedness, trying to help countries prepare to receive the shocks the same way that we try to advance it successfully with natural disasters. During the crisis, let's remember that the impacts are mainly local, that refugees will only prosper in prospering economies. So we need to continue to address the longstanding uh, development issues. And then it's about jobs, which means about drawing in the private sector. It's about service delivery and the shift to country systems. And it's about um, uh, trying to advocate on a case-by-case -case basis, taking into account uh, the context, for the right to work and, and a degree of freedom of movement. And when we think about solutions, it's really about trying to help make return successful. It's maybe trying to support the countries that are willing to go for uh, 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 some form of uh, legal solution for people who are de facto integrated. And sometimes it's seen only as naturalization, but you know there are all sorts of intermediate steps that can be done. For example, with support of UNHCR, and Nigeria accepted or offered to transfer, to convert a refugee status into an economic migrant residency status for some of the uh, Liberian and Sierra Leonean refugees who did not want to uh, go home uh, once peace was uh, re-established in their country. And then I think there's a lot we can learn from our <coughs> experience with social prediction modernization uh, that could maybe apply mutatis mutandis to some of the situations of, of long-term uh, projected uh, situations. A few words on financing. Uh, this is very costly. So humanitarian aid goes beyond for displacement, but as a total, humanitarian assistance went from 7 billion in 2000 to 28 billion uh, last year. And two-thirds of it goes to crises that have been uh, uh, longer than eight years, right? So we're really no longer in the realm of the uh, emergency uh, response in most cases. Now, this is not to say that humanitarian aid is not important, that we should shift to development assistance, not at all. We still need humanitarian assistance. Humanitarian aid remains absolutely critical. I think the question is whether and how development finance can complement it. And so I can talk a little bit in the details of, of development finance solutions. Uh, it gets easily fairly technical. So let me just focus on a, on a few things. Um, one is we need to think about development finance as an investment. So we pay today to reduce the cost tomorrow. So we try to do projects today that will reduce the needs uh, tomorrow. It's not about emergency. It's not about care and maintenance. It's not about compensation. It's really about trying to promote solutions that will reduce the need for external assistance over time. Two is that a lot of us are struggling with the fact that we have financing models that are based on countries, and yet refugees don't live in their countries. And so cont countries are not willing to use their development resources for foreigners. You know, you, you can, I mean, different people have different views on this on a very personal level. I, I can easily understand that. And so I think the question is how do we go around that and how do we create dedicated streams of resources to support those countries which are the bank we are, we are uh, uh, doing. And then finally, that this is really not only about projects. This is about a dialogue. This is about a conversation with the authorities to try to shift a little bit the conversation, and in particular to shift the policy environment. Now, looking ahead, and just to go back on this, on this nexus, uh, um, so from, from our perspective, what's very uh, good is that we are um, able to rely on our friends and partners at UNHCR to really make sure that what we do is not rediscovering uh, the wheel, right, or reinventing the wheel. Um, I think we see our competitive advantages in the fact that we have medium-term financing, in the fact that we have analytical you know, capacities, um, in the fact that we have a different set of counterparts uh, from UNHCR. They tend to talk to the Commissioner for Refugees or Equivalent. We tend to talk to the Minister of Finance or Equivalent. And so <clears throat> by you know, 
attacking the government on, or attacking maybe a strong word, by engaging with the government on, on both sides, uh, we may have uh, a better outcomes. So in terms of positive development in this partnership, I think there's a great degree of hope um, that we will move a little bit further than some of the initiatives that I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. Because there is increasingly a degree of institutionalization of, of this relationship, both at headquarter levels between our heads, uh, but also at field level, where we are also doing joint work. Um, uh, and Teresa uh, will talk about it, so let me, uh, uh, let me not uh, uh, say much about it. Uh, at the same time, it's just the beginning. And as anybody who has been engaged in a, in a, in a marriage or in a long-term relationship, uh, uh, when we go you know, with time, we discover uh, new challenges that, that we have to resolve together. Um, so <clears throat> I think the first, you know, so some of the challenges that we see now, the main one is really this need for translation. We just don't speak the same language. I mean, it happens to be English or some form of English, uh, but actually we don't mean the same thing when we use the same words. Uh, we have completely different business cultures. We have completely different ways to look at this. UNHCR is largely an, an institution of lawyers. We are largely an institution of economists. Uh, and you know, we, we, we need uh, a, degree of, uh, a degree of translation. And that's one of the challenges that there is uh, uh, and, and the team she's, she's working in, that uh, I and, 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 and my team uh, are really trying to facilitate to make sure that this conversation can actually uh, take place. I think we also need to make sure that there is no confusion about our goals, about the fact that we're very, very slow compared to UNHCR, compared to humanitarian actors. And so <clears throat> if, if, if these expectations are not right, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we're deemed or doomed uh, to have lots of confusion and therefore uh, frustration. Um, and then basically, <clears throat> um, uh, an additional issue for us is, and uh, that we also discussed with UNHCR, is how large do you want the tent to be? So if you want uh, the full nexus stakeholders, um, you have about 10 or 15 UN agencies, you have about 10-ish uh, multilateral development banks, you have large numbers of bilaterals, you have large numbers of NGOs. Now, you can include everybody in the conversation, um, but then it's going to be very, very heavy, right? On the other hand, you can just focus and say, you know, the two of us will move ahead, uh, but it's very exclusive, right? And so I think one of the questions we will have to resolve is, you know, how open do we want this long-term relationship, uh, or how open do we want our marriage to be? Um, and then finally, you know, we talk a lot about humanitarians and development actors, but let's not forget that, first and foremost, the key actors are the government. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Xavier. So much to uh, so much to to actually say. Um, I, I, because of time, I'm going to move to Teresa, but it, even just still, it's so interesting to see because most of the, the people in this room, although some have, uh, well, they have varied, varied backgrounds, but really see it from a health perspective. UNHCR sees it very much from a prote protection uh, perspective, and then the bank clearly sees it from an economic perspective. And somehow, if they can all meld, um, uh, it'll, be, it'll be better for everyone, but it's not so easy. The next uh, presenter is another colleague and friend, um, Teresa Beltramo, as we do this, I'm gonna bring it up, and Teresa, we can see you. Let me just bring, it. there we go, okay. I'll bring this up and then I will introduce you. And we can see you, Teresa, as well, in the, in the corner up there, and we, we can see your slides. But um, it's a pleasure to introduce Teresa, who I was working with at UNHCR for the last uh, two years or so. Um, Teresa's actually one of the, believe it or not, one of the first economists that we have had at UNHCR. And Xavier spoke about the, the translation. It was hugely important uh, because the cultures are so different. And Teresa's one of the first, and now we have another person that also uh, in Kenya that works for, had worked for the bank previously and now works for UNHCR. Um, and these people are whisperers, you know, they try to explain what's going on and slowly we're getting it. Um, Teresa is a senior economist at HCR. She previously 
um, worked for, her first degree was in anthropology, followed by a master's, oh, okay, you know, I forgot that, Teresa, a master's degree from John Hopkins at SAIS in quantitative economics and international economics. I had forgotten that. So you're actually a Hopkins grad. And a PhD in economics at uh, Kafoskari University. She was a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley's Institute for Research on Labor and Employment, and she was previously affiliated, affiliated with UC Berkeley's Center for Effective Global Action. Um, always a pleasure to hear Teresa, and I'm going to hand it over to you, and when you want me to switch the slides, just say next slide. So thank you. Thanks, Paul. Can, can you hear me okay? Yep, perfectly. Fantastic. Good. So. Thanks very much, Paul, uh, to you uh, for this invitation uh, to uh, the Center for Refugee and Disaster Response, or I guess the future Hopkins Center for Humanitarian Health. It's a pleasure to be uh, interacting with academics, uh, you know, and it's really kind of a rare event that policymakers from both humanitarian development space and academics actually get together to discuss what constitutes this space and um, you know, to, to think with you on uh, this dialogue. So really a pleasure uh, to be here. And also, uh, finally, uh, always great to go after Xavier, uh, uh, you know, uh, who's been really instrumental in this uh, work so far, and who he never fails to deliver a very comprehensive overview, which makes my job very easy. So um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the oper how do we operationalize this coordinated programming between development and humanitarian institutions and, and give some examples and, and try to spur some discussions. So uh, next slide. So, Paul, this slide is animated, which uh, was a mistake now that uh, we're here. But so why don't you just click all the way through it? Perfect. So. You know, in order to have a discussion, it's important to understand what we're talking about. So, you know, Xavier and I have been talking, lots of us have been talking, what is this humanitarian development nexus? You know, according to the uh, Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the definition is, is here. Um, but each of these different uh, definitions imbue some slightly different or actually very different meaning. So, you know, the first, if the development humanitarian nexus is a causal link between the two, then is it that the humanitarian world is a causal link for development and or vice versa? You know, if the development humanitarian nexus is a center or focus, does this mean that we have a shared focus for both set of actors? If the if this nexus uh, is a connected group or series, does this mean that it, we're, we have a connected population group, a set of populations or geographic areas? And this last definition perhaps is the closest to the Latin definition, where nexus comes from the Latin verb to bind, to fasten together, to tie, join together. So I hope to explore a little bit uh, in the next few minutes about how, how these two worlds are inextricably, inextricably linked. Um, so I hope you know, this will spur discussion, as mentioned from you, to really help us think together about uh, reflections on, on what is the shared space. Next slide. So before I get into the operational examples, I, I'd like to, if you could allow me to summarize broadly some wider connected approaches that are led by humanitarian actors today. So first, embedding into national systems. You know, UNHCR education and health teams are both actively working to integrate education and health programming into national systems. There's been a focus from the humanitarian world uh, to, towards cash-based interventions. This programming can offer refugees and forcibly displaced people a cost-effective tool that can empower them to determine and meet their own needs, increasing their dignity, choice, and protection, both during protection, uh, displacement and upon return. Cash interventions have also uh, been noted to have a higher degree of um, involvement of the affected communities in the planning and implementation of program delivery, this making them more attractive potentially. And then, uh, in addition, in some settings, there's been some research, research that's shown that there's higher economic multiplier effects on the local economy when you use cash versus uh, distribution of food. In fact, a recent study uh, from Rwanda, led by UC Davis's Ed Taylor, finds that providing cash instead of food to refugees in Rwanda has a large, larger multiplier effect on the local economy. In the camps uh, where refugees received food at the time of the study, 
Researchers found that every dollar's worth of food for refugees increased real income for the community around the camp by $1.20. But in the other two camps, where refugees randomly received cash transfers each month instead of food, each dollar they received translated into $1.50 to up to $1.95 in the local economy. So this evidence is also shifting humanitarian action strategy. Another uh, initiative or um, approach that's, that's important to note that humanitarian, act humanitarian actors are leading on that relates to the space is our shift towards longer planning cycles. So for example, UNHCR traditionally has had um, a one-year budget and planning cycle. However, that's really misaligned with the multi-year uh, planning and strategy that's needed for uh, looking for comprehensive durable solutions. And so along that line, UNHCR has introduced the multi-year protection and solution strategies, which is based on this framework of a comprehensible durable solution, which uh, acts on four dimensions, the legal dimension, the economic dimension, social and cultural, and political and civil uh, dimension. And then further, as we're entering this, um, you know, as we're, we're kind of uh, joining together uh, our, our needs, we, UNHCR and development actors both need socioeconomic data for planning and targeting of assistance. Uh, humanitarian actors, I'll speak from UNHCR's perspective, have really um, been spurred into action, uh, you know, by the, uh, by the, you know, the, the limited resources that we have have to have to really think creatively and and more uh, thoughtfully about how do we generate robust data uh, on socioeconomics that we need for uh, for targeting. Next slide. So I'd like to now I'm going to zoom in on two examples and I'm going to try to be brief so we can leave time to discuss. I'm very interested in. in in talking with you. So uh, the first for I'm going to talk about is uh, is in Kenya in, in a site called uh, Kakuma. And I'll speak a little bit about thinking around this this new Turkana initiative. So for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Kakuma has hosted one of the longest lasting refugee camps in the world. And refugees have uh, become an integral part of Kakuma's social, cultural and economic fabric. The Kakuma refugee camp is one of the, uh, the largest in Africa. Uh, it's located in northwestern uh, Kenya, you can see here, in uh, Turkana County, which is at the crossroads of Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Uganda, and home to some uh, over 190,000 refugees. South Sudanese make up the majority, over 52% of the camp's population, but again, the camp hosts uh, some 15 nationalities. The camp is characterized as a protracted refugee situation, complicated by an emergency influx. And many of these refugees have spent up to 20 years uh, in this camp. Uh, the camp was established in 1991 um, from, for the South Sudanese emergency. Uh, but since the outbreak of the out ongoing conflict in South Sudan, beginning in December 2013, some 46,000 South Su Sudanese refugees have sought uh, refuge in Kakuma camp. So in light uh, of, of the ongoing violence, you know, colleagues have... Uh, believe that the refugee population in Kakuma is actually expected to continue to grow. So here, this is a classic example of one type of refugee setting UNHCR and partners work in, a refugee camp which is located in a marginalized, underdeveloped border area. In fact, in the local uh, language, uh, in Swahili, Kakuma means nowhere. Uh, <clears throat> To give you a perspective of, uh, you know, what we mean by uh, marginalized, underdeveloped border area, you know, a forthcoming World Bank uh, report uh, that we've jointly been visioning about uh, notes that one striking observation about the Kakuma refugee camp is how vibrant the economy is and how refugee-owned businesses also serve host communities. Uh, this report highlights a um, colleague's uh, memory that when there was talk of closing Kakuma in the early 2000s there was an uproar among the host community who saw the camp as their main source of employment, uh, business opportunities, and commercial goods. So here in underdevelopment areas, UNHCR typically brings services like education, health, wash, energy. Uh, we, we act as, as a, we facilitate the role of the government in, in areas like this to both chronically underserved host communities as well as refugees. So intertwining existing service delivery by humanitarian actors with a wider regional area-based approach uh, from development actors 
is an, another example of how the two set of actors are joined together. Next slide. So, uh, you know, given this setting that I just described, where we have this protracted caseload that has um, is encamped, which has limited rights, UNHCR, together with all the stakeholders, you know, including development actors, um, have been shifting their their approach towards a comprehensive durable solution to replace the ongoing care and maintenance, uh, which is based on the assumption that refugees that the refugee situation is temporary and that a solution for displacement would be found soon. We know that that's not um, really happening and that's not becoming a reality. So this it has, has um, really uh, pushed for a paradigm shift. Now, uh, in order to reorient the refugee assistance program, UNHCR uh, has launched the Turkana Initiative, um, which is in collaboration with the national and county governments, bilateral donors, UN agencies, the private sector, NGOs, and development. And the objective has uh, three overall, um, I'm sorry, the, the initiative has three overall objectives. First, to uh, reorient the assistance program by the, uh, contributing to the improvement of the socioeconomic conditions uh, for both refugee and host communities. Uh, to better prepare the host community to take advantage of emerging economic opportunities in upcoming extraction and potential irrigation-fed agriculture, and to reduce overdependence on humanitarian aid and prepare the refugees for durable solutions. A new site um, outside of Kakuma is being uh, currently planned with these above-mentioned stakeholders, of course, including development actors. And this is really an innovative approach towards integrative ser uh, service delivery, uh, and promoting an alternative to camp approach through the integration of forced, uh, displaced, and host community you know, in a community-like setting. Next slide. So let me take you uh, to uh, the Lake Chad Basin uh, to provide you another example. Uh, so here in, uh, you can see here on the, um, on the right-hand side of, of, of Niger, uh, the Differ region, since 2013, uh, Niger's Differ region has been receiving refugee from, refugees from Nigeria's Bor Borno, Adamoa, and Yobi state as a result of the increased violence between the Nigerian armed forces and the Islamic sect Boko Haram. As of May 2016, the Differ region, which is estimated at some 600,000 uh, inhabitants, uh, has about a third of its population now as N uh, Nigerian refugees. However, my colleagues tell me that this fact is actually inherently difficult to um, to, to state accurately, uh, given Niger's quite an ex extreme poverty. Uh, it's 188 out of 188 countries on the Human Development Index, and it's plagued by low civil uh, re registration of its own population. So over half the population in the Differ region don't don't have a birth certificate. So a challenge here for UNHCR and, and partners is how do we uh, assess who is a forcibly displaced person and who's not uh, in the region? So due to the conflict and the security, uh, another uh, contributing factor to uh, you know the, uh, the the crisis there is that the vital trade routes between uh, Niger and Nigeria have been shut down, having really severe impacts on the economy. This has reduced the absorption capacity of the host community and additionally the capacity of the displaced people to support themselves. And uh, the fertile zone here that uh, for agricultural activities uh, has in, you know, not only seen the Nigerian populations displaced along Lake Chad, but also has um, had many internally displaced people themselves. The pastoral routes, which is a lifeline for livelihoods has been destroyed, cross-border border exchange and trade uh, along the Boso Diffa axis is now almost non-existent, and this has le uh, left several major markets closed. Further, food security has deteriorated. Um, a, a report coming out of uh, WFP in 2000, late 2014 cites that 53% um, of households are experiencing food security insecurity excuse me, in the Diffa region. So within this context, let me go to the next slide. <clears throat> Humanitarian actors have you know faced with these challenges have have tried to employ a development approach to uh, the energy environment challenges there. So let me center this discussion back on the humanitarian development nexus that we discussed up front. Climate change is a cross-cutting issue that binds the two set of actors together. In the case of the Lake Chad Basin, it is a plausible hypothesis that climate change is causally linked with economic downturn, which is linked with armed extremism 
which is linked with forced displacement. So Niger and countries surrounding Lakes Chad uh, prior to the Boko Haram crisis were already some of the heaviest hit countries by climate change. There are also some of the poorest countries. Uh, and within that context, the energy and environment sector emerged as um, really an important um, risk factor for the community. And in fact, UNHCR in a um, needs assessment discovered that one of the main expenses of the household uh, is wood for cooking. So among this myriad of problems facing the, uh, the region and the forcibly displaced and host community members, UNHCR and partners have had to think creatively for how to meet the energy demands for cooking for the large influx. Uh, here we, we can see is an example of where the, the link between humanitarian and development actors uh, extend a joint responsibility for making progress on the sustainable development goals. For example, uh, SDG 7, um, which is, uh, sets out to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all, UNHCR's team was faced with this classic problem of providing a sustainable solution in a resource-constrained world and one where everything was a priority for the population. So to meet this challenge, we've had to think outside the box. And first, um, we look to the, the national strategy, and Niger has a national uh, strategy for domestic, uh, domestic gas use, which aims to uh, provide low-cost expansion of natural gas throughout Niger. In order to assess the viability of the, strategy, of the strategy in the DIFA region, UNHCR, together with the EU, conducted a feasibility study to assess the supply pipeline and the cost viability. Um, both, you know, the feasibility study provided the right insight that was needed at the beginning, and um, this project, you know, was able to plan according to uh, the parameters that were laid out in the study. So at the start of this project, the DIFFER region had a really limited coverage of nat natural gas. Um, and um, to en enable the expansion of coverage, um, UNHCR worked with uh, an existing distributor, the uh, Société Nigerienne de uh, Hydrocarbons, to expand its local distribution network uh, for this company to settle permanently in the different region. Um, the project aimed to strengthen the existing national company through a targeted phase phased approach. Um, in order to lay out a sustainable pathway for addressing this common uh, environmental degra degradation problem uh, from increased demand by forcibly displaced for wood and biomass for cooking. The prog uh, program has been developed in collaboration with the government and in particular by the Ministry of Energy and Petroleum, as well as funded by uh, jointly by the EU and UNHCR. So how does the program work? Uh, UNHCR provides the initial capital to uh, this, this uh, existing distributor of gas to create a customer base in these new uh, seven zones. They provide the initial subsidization um, of, the, uh, and the, of both the fixed cost for the gas container and the first six months of, uh, of gas that the household will need. And then after six months, the subsidization ends and the population is required to pay 100% of the costs. Program monitoring has shown that households save on average uh, 11,000 seifa uh, per month, and this sums up to some 30, 300 hectares of forest saved per month in the Differ region. <clears throat> the program reaches more than 100, 140,000 people. It includes uh, outside camp beneficiaries of uh, 17,000 from the host community, 3,000 internally displaced, and then the rest are, uh, are refugees from uh, Nigeria. And uh, including including some ID pop, IDP populations. So uh, next slide. The example of the uh, Niger Diffa region natural gas gas program I hope can break down some myths that humanitarian agencies only provide handouts. Instead, um, UNHCR programs, this is an example, are beginning to employ different models like pay for uh, energy services, which come from development. Uh, you know, humanitarian development actors are bound together on large global challenges like climate change, access to services, governance. Um, these are captured in the SDGs. Uh, in, an, in, in the example where under, in, of an underdeveloped area like Turkana County, UNHCR typically brings services uh, as like education, energy, health, and WASH to both chronically underserved host communities as well as refugees. Intertwining existing service delivery by humanitarian actors with a wider re regional area-based approach uh, purported by development actors is another example of how the two set uh, of communities are joined together.
Next slide. So let me agree with Xavier that the agenda ahead is really multifold. We agree that data and evidence, evidence is a necessary uh, shared piece of, of this humanitarian development nexus. We, we particularly are focused on socioeconomic data um, for targeting assistance and programming. Uh, second, a focus on integrated service delivery. Um, again, but being able to take UNHCR's uh, service delivery of uh, education, health, and, and laying that over a wider regional area-based approach by development actors is really another example of how we are, are joined or bound together. And um, as Xavier mentioned, this will only move forward at the fastest pace uh, by expanding the humanitarian actors interlocutors beyond the refugee coordinate, coordination agency to development partner interlocutors uh, like respective line ministries. We agree that uh, we both need to be working uh, together towards solution to, to support return and integration, help shrink uh, situations of lasting limbo, and we really can only do this best together. Uh, and then finally, you know, accounting of forcibly displaced people in progress towards the SDGs. This is really another area of joint where our joint efforts um, are necessary to make progress uh, for these people. So next slide. So let me conclude there uh, and open the floor to, to Paul for and for questions. Thank you. yourself and uh okay, my name is Teresa can you hear uh, yes i can okay good Go ahead, and then Teresa after uh, Xavier. I mean, there is a, there is a space as wide as the universe. I mean, I think the the the, the reality is that we know very little from from our perspective in terms of development needs, right? So, um, I mean, let me just take a few examples, right? So we talk about host communities. Who are they? Where are they? How many people are we talking about? No idea. I say it's just no number, right? Because because it's it's very very difficult. Um, uh, we talked about I see, but but you know, let me just take a, a step back. I see. I think there is. Um, for, so from my perspective, there are two agendas that are very important in terms of research. One is really to try to clarify the narrative and to straighten the narrative, um, because as we said before. You know, when you say 65 million people are at the door of your country, you don't need to be a big xenophobe to kind of feel frightened. Uh, when you start to break down the, the numbers, you realize that actually things are a little bit more uh, uh, complicated. When you try to, est to establish and discuss the difference between economic migrants, refugees, and so on, I think it all helps to clarify the narrative and therefore to clarify the political environment in which this crisis is being addressed. But I think there's another uh, set of issues which is, which is very important, which is, you know, we say these people have specific needs. Well, exactly which ones? And is it uh, at the country level, right? How does this play out? Do refugees, do Somali refugees in Nairobi uh, fare better than Somali refugees in Kakuma? As, you know, there's some evidence, but it's not the sort of evidence that you, I mean, this university would consider, you know, would, would, would pass your standards, right? Um, now we're, we're talking about, uh, um, you know, trying to support 
uh, these people? What are the programs that work? What are the programs that don't work? What kind of impact evaluation do we really have on some of these development uh, uh, programs geared towards uh, for displacement? So I think there's a lot to do in terms of shifting the narrative, but also building the, the, building the evidence. And in a way, because there is so much money at stake, making sure that this money is used as effectively as possible. Teresa, do you recognizing that you'll probably get 20 emails asking to do research uh, immediately after this lecture? <laughs> I welcome. Uh, those are welcome. So yes, uh, you know, a couple points uh, to compliment. I won't repeat what Xavier said, but you know, one area that we're actively working with universities and now is on te technical capacity building internally. So you know, for example, where um, our livelihoods and energy team have recently revised our, our indicators much. Uh, led by Paul before he left us, and myself with the team. So there we're pulling in uh, universities, a university to help us uh, roll out these indicators and, and have students come in and help us build technical capacity for our new monitoring system that's a, a much more robust quantitative system, um, you know, having students come out and, and with research method backgrounds. So that's one uh, area. It's certainly quantifying the economic impact of refugees on host communities is uh, a really vast understudied field. We commissioned two uh, studies uh, this year ourselves because we're so motivated, even within our given res uh, really limited resources. But you know, we're welcoming more and more research on that. I, I cited one uh, study uh, by Ed Taylor in, uh, Davis on cash, and, and that study really helps us make more uh, better policy decisions on on the efficiency of the type of program we want to roll out. So, you know, from a health perspective. Uh, Paul can give you many ideas of what uh, research areas to work on, but there's many questions left unknown that would be help us rationalize what kind of service delivery and when, um, you know, working towards embedding in, that, in national systems, how, how and, and when is that feasible? I mean, you know, th there's some knowledge already, but uh, thinking in that in that area. So, and on, also on the debate itself, the more we can engage in, in a um, outside of our respective, you know. Uh, sort of uh, silos and have academics cross over into the policy debate uh, is 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 only going to make this a, a more factual, import, you know, and a uh, broader discussion that, that needs to happen. So in that same right uh, light, for us, another key um, important piece is as this is a very small space, but it, it luckily has been growing uh, in terms of building the evidence base. We, how do we disseminate research better and, you know, get it to the you know, to the real stakeholders, which are the, you know, the voters in, in countries, um, help them understand better what has been the impact, uh, really, factually, about uh, of uh, forced displaced people on uh, host communities, and, and how do we uh, know what is um, a negative impact and what is a positive impact, and how do we mitigate negative impacts with policy? So, thanks. I thought that was so clearly outlined last night. Uh, <laughs> next question, comments. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Hussein Usanji. I'm a surgeon from Canada working at Laval University. Uh, merci beaucoup pour la présentation. Both presentations were excellent. Thank you very much. I'd like to hear your thoughts on a uh, situation where uh, employers in uh, Lebanon will, will use uh, Syrian workers at a cheaper price without any rights instead of uh, workers in uh, uh, Lebanese. Uh, Workforce and how can the, we optimize this, or how can the Lebanese people or Syrian people benefit from this? Jones. I mean, um, it's obviously, uh, I mean, it's obviously a very uh, difficult uh, question, and so I'm, I'm just going to reflect on it. I'm not necessarily going to respond to it, and everything I say should be caveated by, you know, lots of nuances that come with the context, right? But I think so. So, so, so the Lebanese authorities have been afraid that because there are so many refugees, this would have a very uh, negative uh, impact on their own labor market. Uh, uh, and when you look at the numbers, I mean, it's a fair, uh, I mean, it's a fair concern, right? We are finalizing a report that actually looks at um, what's happening in terms of labor force participation and, and incomes in Lebanon for the refugees, and comparing it to what's happening in the to Kurdish part of Iraq, where you essentially also have Syrian refugees, but there they have the right to work. Right. And so what's very interesting is that, and I'm just simplifying, obviously, for, for the sake of this presentation, once again, everything has to be uh, uh, qualified. 
uh, no, but, but what's very interesting is that uh, one of the findings is that the employment rates are by and large the same. So whether you give people the right to work or you don't give them the right to work, they still work. But the wage gaps are very different. So in Lebanon, you do have a very significant wage gap, while in the Kurdish part of Iraq, you don't, right? And so it's really not about predicting your labor market. It's much more about the political economy of your country and who do you want to compete with these refugees and whether you want to make the best of them. From, a, from an aggregate perspective, obviously, if you get people to work at the level of their qualifications, you, you win, right? You gain. Uh, um, I think the, the question is really about how do you manage the politics around it, which obviously are, are, are very different. From our own perspective, um, uh, what's happening is, is obviously very suboptimal. Now we also realize that you know there are there are constraints, there are political constraints in Lebanon. But the broader point there is that when people talk about the labor market uh, uh, impacts of, of the presence of refugees, you know every year the bank is publishing this report called Doing Business, which actually ranks countries in terms of the ease of doing business, so, so, so business climate, so Singapore ranks first, and you know, Afghanistan is close to the bottom. Uh, on average, so there are 180 countries, on average, the uh, host countries rank 140. So if there is no job, it may be a bit because of refugees, but it's not only because of refugees, and there are huge problems that actually may need to be sorted out. Thank you, Teresa. I'm going to have to end it there because I'm getting the, uh, we have our, our colleagues in the next classes coming. So I want to thank uh, Teresa and Xavier very much. Uh, this will also be, uh, it's a webinar that is a video, so it will also be able to share with everyone the links. Thank you very much. Thank you.